Um, Hello there. Welcome, Nicholas. Hello, you catch me. Sorry, finishing my chocolate. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. You I think... thought I had a few more seconds there. Yeah, yeah you... <laughs> Martin, you've got a tough act to follow. I was, I, um, I printed off the question. He told me some of the questions he's going to ask me, and I printed them off to try and work out what I was going to say over dinner. And my younger son discovered them, and we've been prepping him for interviews. So he had great fun. He immediately started giving me the third degree on them. And as soon as I said hum or ha, he said, that's not good enough. Come on, answer the question. So, uh, <laughs> so I think you've got a tough act to follow. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'll go a lot gentler on you than, uh, than he did, I, I suspect. I think you'll find this a, a piece of cake compared with that. Uh, well, thank you. Really, you know, really appreciate you joining us this evening. And, um, you know, the, the, by the magic of, of Zoom, we can uh, join you in your um, room in, in London, I guess. I'm afraid so. I have to fess up. I'm in London, not Leeds. Please, please forgive yeah. me and please, please, please be gentle. <laughs> We'll forgive you. We'll forgive you. Maybe maybe next time you can you can get up the get, uh, get on the train. Not the HS two, but obviously, but no, uh, clearly not. <laughs> um, so yeah, I am um, really grateful uh, for, for you joining us this evening. And um, rather than me introduce you, I thought it might be better if you introduce yourself because clearly you've got a number of strings to your bow. Um, so could you say a little bit about um, about about your um, you know your interests and, and and the various activities that you carry out and i, I guess why why lead civic trust should should be should be interested in hearing what you have to well, say if you like well, I, i'm not sure i'm not, I'm not sure i'd say you should i well, thank you for asking <laughs> uh, I, i'm certainly i'm not asked that last guy i'll leave that to everyone else to decide whether it's um worth listening to i, I hope it is um so i um uh, i don't come uh, and I, I make no apology for this I, I don't come from a built environment sort of background i had a sort of varied career this is very much my second career uh, in in a range of things, um, uh, working offshore, worked in uh, in Switzerland and Brussels and various places. Partly, sometimes as a civil servant, sometimes as a banker and, and consultant. Um, and my interest in the built environment, I think, has always been latent. So you know, probably like many people on the on the call, I suspect, you know, went round old houses and places with my parents um, as a youngster always interested in architecture, certainly read about it uh, when I was at university. And then it sort of blossomed up, and this is not a sentence that you want to hear often, it blossomed up about 10 years ago uh, on a trip to b and to buy pot plants, obviously, um, uh, as I was driving past uh, a um, one of the big London, South London, sort of brutalist estates, which they were starting to, to, to regenerate, to use the, the lingo. Um, and I was very interested in, I just got curious, I, I sort of Googled it, wondered what they were doing, and at a very superficial level, was was appalled. I mean, sort of, you know, it sort of struck me as my instinct had been, I thought many of the post-war uh, estates perhaps didn't quite work, which I, I think is true. Um, why isn't this a lot better? And it seemed to me that it wasn't better. So I, I um, and I promise I won't give you my whole life story, but uh, at the time, I the business I was running was, was largely international. Uh, my boss wasn't in the same country as me, so I frankly I bunked off work on a Friday afternoon and went to um, interview the guy who'd pulled this area action plan together. And I'd sort of got into the habit at work when I didn't quite understand something of asking very basic questions. So I asked this guy a series of very basic questions, uh, essentially why we're we delivering, why we're we designing and developing this, but at heart, what do people like? Where do people want to be? What sort of places make people happy? Where do we lead good lives? And his answers, uh, and that's where I haven't said which estate it is, uh, his answers were so poor um, and he clearly regarded me as an idiot, which uh, maybe I am, I don't know. But um, it, it seemed to me I wasn't asking stupid questions. They maybe were basic questions, but they weren't stupid. Um, and he couldn't answer them. And it seemed to me that someone in his job should be able to answer them. So the more I read about it, the more I thought, I don't think the, actually getting quite good evidence on the sorts of places that people like and where they're happy and why, I don't think that's influencing planning policy. And I don't think it's influencing enough of what we deliver or develop. And I think that matters. And I can't find people who are talking about it in the way I think it should be talked about that would be effective. And to finally answer a question, so that, that's as if you like, that's why I went mad and gave up my job and, and set up Crate Streets. Um, and the community-led placemaking, which you also mentioned on, I, I think, uh, hopefully this is an answer that, uh, that I, I genuinely mean it, hopefully it's one you'll like. Um, I have, I think I've come to have huge latent, tr uh, huge trust in neighbourhoods, latent ability when dealt with honestly to recognise what is good and what isn't good, uh, and to uh, to uh, to argue for it. So I, I have huge confidence in the British people's and any people's uh, ability to co-create good places, which I guess is where the interest in that comes from. 
There you go. I, I'm not sure whether that justifies listening to me, but I noticed the number of people listening has gone up by two while I said it. I don't know what that means. But... <laughs> yeah, there's the, there's, the, there's the meter at the bottom, and that's a that's a sort of popularity index. Yeah, you know, if it starts zooming possibly, down, we should yeah. probably stop. It, it, it can also be dodgy internet connections, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Well, I will if it starts going down. <laughs> Um, yeah, so just say, tell us a little bit more then about Create Streets, this organisation that you um, launched. OK, thank you. I will, I will keep it short. Um, so Create Streets is a, a social enterprise with an associated charity, um, the Create Streets Foundation, which is a legally slightly separate organisation, but very similar. Um, I mean, at heart, we, we exist to solve the problem I just talked about. But I, I guess I try and put it as saying um, uh, and the British people have over the last few generations too often, I don't blame them for this, by the way, have too often come to have the instinctive response, not unreasonably, that new development will make places worse. And as I say, it's, that's not an unreasonable belief, sadly, in many cases. Uh, and I think Create Streets exists to, to try and solve that. And I don't, we don't kid ourselves that that's easy. That's quite a big ask. It's a generational ask. So as I said, this is my second career, the second half of my working life is so dedicated to this. I've got, I've got 30 years. I'm about eight years in. Um, and how we do that, um, and we, you know, we're quite a small organisation. We're growing quite slowly because, you know, we're not sort of normal. Um, uh, at heart, we do or commission or read that type of research. Where are people happy? Where do they know their neighbours more? Where do they walk more? Where do they breathe cleaner air? What's more popular? So we do that research and we try and promulgate it. Um, and then just to bring it to life, and partly to fund it, we work with a quite wide range, a very wide range now, of neighbourhood and community groups, so if you like, at our, they're at our heart. Um, we also, I mean, on, if it's, you know, on either helping them create neighbourhood plans or helping them advance master plans or helping them set the parameters for design and development in conjunction with, you know, perhaps a landowner. Um, and then we also now work, uh, it's probably now about 50% of our work, give or take, it's certainly gone up a lot in the last couple of years uh, with, with councillors and landowners and to a lesser degree, some developers, um, yeah, essentially on the same thing. I'm trying to set the, the, the outline of the master plan and the visions and the parameters. And if you like, make sure that the, the types of work if like, that the research suggests tends to be popular and good is influencing what happens and that the process of engaging with communities is, I was going to say honest, that sounds a bit sanctimonious, is, is effective. That's perhaps a less pompous way of putting it. Um, again, I, could, I, can, I can talk about credit for years, but I'll, I'll stop there otherwise. Oh, it's gone down. It's gone down from 93 to 91. So there we go. That was a bad answer. I, I better keep quiet. Okay, hurry up. Sorry. You, well, yeah, we, we look at the, we'll look at the analytics afterwards and see what, see what, see, see who, 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 who nipped out for a cup of tea, which I'm oh, sure is left. <laughs> um, so, Nicholas, um, that was really helpful as a, as a sort of a scene setter. Um, and, and of course, uh, you, you know, some of the other things you've been involved in, I guess, I guess, flows from the, the, the work that you've done uh, and have been doing with Create Streets um, is your involvement in the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. Um, and one, you know, th there is this sort of overriding idea of beauty, isn't there, in, in, in buildings and what, you know, what constitutes beauty? I mean, is, is it something that you can define objectively? Is it a personal view? Do you think there are certain, you know, rules that, 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 that define what, how something might be beautiful. What, what, what would you say to the concept of beauty in buildings? First of all, I'd say, thank God you're not my son. He gave me a really tough one on this one. <laughs> um, no. he, he told me my answer was nonsense. So <laughs> I hope you'll be nicer. Um, um, I mean, I'm not gonna give a philosophical answer. Um, I'll try and give a practical one, which is, um, I think, I know this is slightly, slightly in the spirit that you asked, asked the question, I think. Um, the 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 point of setting beauty as an aim of the planning system, which it is now set alongside uh, sustainable development in the MPPF, National Planning Policy Framework, you know, is very much not so that, you know, uh, the government or I or anyone else can sort of come and tell you in Leeds, this is beautiful, this is good development. That would not, not only would it not be right, it would be perverse. Um, the, um, the point of it is, if you like, is to set it as a name. And when we used to, it used to be quite normal, it used to be commonplace for us as a society to aspire to create beautiful places. And then anyone who told you otherwise would just be seen as, well, why on earth wouldn't you want to do that? And if you, if you look at the mothers and fathers of the, the planning system, and indeed actually of town planning in the 19th and 18th centuries, that is what the people that we all now know the names of, as opposed to the ones we've forgotten, would aspire to do. So, I mean, I think the idea that it's an aim 
just without before we get into the definition, I think obviously has has become peculiar, but I think we should make it normal again. We should renormalize it and you know, go back to the pre-war settlement where that just seemed completely obvious, because why wouldn't we want to do that? Point two, to perhaps more specifically answer your question, um, would be, um, no, you can't say, I can't say, you'd be delighted to say, Martin, I can't say what you will find beautiful, um, and maybe you can't say what I will find beautiful, um, but you can pull out, and this is this is very different from the top-down aim, this is the, the bottom-up discovery of what is locally popular. Um, you can, uh, certainly once you start doing research, reasonably easily predict what most people will like most of the time so we do lots of visual preference surveys not that you know we you can look at evidence on what people will pay for you can look at evidence where people walk more where they know more of the neighbors you know when you're taking a metric for what it looks like how people behave you get very clear and i we could probably dive into this in more, more detail further down when you know people have not enough yet but um you get real slants in the data of the types of places that people like um and they tend to they tend to rhyme they tend to have similar themes so um uh, talking about buildings, you know, a, a street that's got complex composure. So as you get closer to it, there's texture and detail, but as you step away from it, it resolves itself into a pattern, which has got some sort of coherent complexity to it. Those sort of streets, in, I think, in every visual preference survey poll I've ever seen in, a, in any country are more attractive. And also when they've got a strong sense of place. So um, uh, I don't think that's an objective definition of beauty. And I, I'm not sure whether you can have that or not. I think you can have an objective definition of what leads to good outcomes and what people find more attractive. And I think the, the process of the, the local plan, local codes and local planning is to find those out, but hopefully in a context where we as a society, citizens, council, developers, landowners, working collaboratively are seeking to do the best that we can and, and are not ashamed so to do, which I think has become a peculiar, it's become peculiar, but to seek to create a beautiful place is see, has became, came to seem to be peculiar. I, I, think that's, I think that's perverse. I'm not sure that's, that's probably not a philosophical answer, but I hope it's of some help. Yeah, I mean, it is. I, I mean, I suppose, uh, you know, an observation I would, I would, I would make uh, looking at the Twitter feed, for example, of Create Streets, is that very often reference is made to uh, uh, building streetscapes um, that, that, that are classical in nature, classical in proportion. Um, do you think that you, there are, there are, certain um, aspects of those um, classical uh, designs, the classical makeup of a street that sort of are, are, are automatically better than, you know, more avant-garde approaches, more, you know, modern approaches to architecture. Do you think we should go back to the classical form and, and that, that by definition more modern, uh, you know, we can think of some of the schemes in, well, across the country that are by definition modern. Uh, do, do you think it excludes modern design? I guess I'm tempted to ask one back, which is, do you mean modern or modernist? Which, of course, is not the same modern, thing. Modern. Well, modern is, is certainly not, um, in the sense that, uh, I mean, what is it that makes places popular? Um, uh, it's, it might, I mean, you know, all of these things don't have to be, and indeed aren't present all the time, but you know, gentle greenery led throughout a settlement, a place where it feels safe to walk, uh, a place where, yes, the buildings are attractive and, and, and found to be so. A place where the enclosure ratio, by which I mean the, the height of the building to the to the width of the public place, is probably about one to one, give or take. These are the sorts of places that people tend to find homely and attractive. Um, to answer your question specifically, I sort of half touched on it, I guess, before, but let me try to be more precise. Does that mean that a building look, needs to look like it was built in 1820, either because it was or because we've just replicated it so to be? No, it absolutely doesn't. You know, full stop, no ifs, no buts. What it does mean, however, though, is that the, the types of uh, form and pattern and uh, embodied, embedded symmetries of a traditional street, as a, just as a, as a statement of observable fact, they are popular with most people most of the time, again, across, um, uh, uh, across nations and, and, and across demographics. Um, can you replicate those without going back to the, exactly the same forms and patterns of 1820? Yes, you clearly can. Um, and there'd be many ways of doing that over many hundreds of years. Um, if you, and this is, I guess, I'm perhaps on a slight little sense of ground here, so I hope I don't get into trouble. Um, if you rip up the rule book of, or to anyway, ignore the evidence on the types of places that people like, um, so if by modern, and, and you didn't, I think, mean this, but some might, if by modern you mean a sheer glass facade that goes up for 200 metres, or 50 metres to be perhaps less realistic, um, yeah, some people will like that. Some people will find that funky and uh, uh, exciting. And there's even a place for it in the city, you know, particularly in the city, perhaps less in the small town. Um, but is that something that most people will find attractive or reassuring most of the time? No, the answer to that is no, they won't. Um, 
does that mean you should never build huge great glass buildings no not quite but it does mean they probably have a more limited time and place um than something that feels more homely and just one overlay sorry it's getting to turn into long answer forgive me um most people i suspect many of the people in lead civic trust I, I can't speak for them care a lot about place um yeah. and certainly one of the things i've seen in many of the focus groups i've run or sat, sat in on over the years is there's been a strong sense and i, I know this is something that people say we always do think um that you know too much development is sort of done at communities is, is faceless is of nowhere and it could be literally the same and it sometimes is the same anywhere from cornwall to cumbria with leads in the middle um that is something most people object to, and it is something that some house builders, not all, would say, but that's that's inherent to our efficient and effective value chains and, uh, and our, you know, keeping our costs down. And in a way, they're right. Well, tough. I, I mean, I don't think we're a poor enough society where we have to cope with that. And so I think somewhere that feels like it comes from here, which I guess often will mean some referencing to the past, but doesn't, I think, need to mean, shouldn't mean necessarily being trapped by it, uh, I think will be attractive and popular with most people. You know, some of the, the volume house builders would say, well, you know, what we build is what people want. This, this is what they expect. Um, they want to buy buildings that look the same in Leeds as they do in Luton or wherever. And, and actually, this is, this, is, this is the market. And if we try and do something different, people won't buy them. Well, I'm eager to get my teeth into that question. <laughs> That's a can <laughs> Um So, I mean, uh, with the greatest respect to, to anyone who might say that, I think that's nonsense. Um, if you look at the pricing data in lots of places, not quite everywhere, but in, in most places, places that if you like, have a real middle and that you can readily walk to a nice mix of uses, and yes, you've got green space and uh, in many places adequate parking laid in, uh, sell for more than places that, if you like, are, the, are the, the lower end of what the volume house builders would say, well, this is what people want. So what, what the volume house builders are good at doing, I, I don't actually, I'm, I'm not trying to sound rude about them because they are responding to the situation they find themselves in, but that's more a function of planning and uh, land allocation that is of market desires. Um, people do say, I mean, the most popular stated desire for a type of house in this country, and actually in every other country in Europe, is a detached house. And people, particularly when they don't have adequate public transport, will not unreasonably say they want adequate parking. Those, 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 those are true statements. And to, to be fair to the volume house builders, they are perfectly reasonably responding to that. Um, however, if you look at the revealed preference, by what will people pay more to live in? Then the sort of place where actually it might come together a bit more. You might be semi-detached house or terraced house. Uh, in some situations, flats, not all. Um, but where you're getting compensating advantage of, uh, advantages excuse me, of propinquity or perhaps being close to the town centre, uh, being somewhere where you can get to, whether it's work or school or, or office or shops, or whatever it might be, not always by jumping in a car, sometimes perhaps by doing so, um, people will actually pay more to live in those places. So by definition, if you're taking numbers as, you know, pounds per square foot and pounds, clearly the, the volume houses aren't quite right, because people will actually pay more to live in places that have advantages and characteristics that, on the whole, with some exceptions, they're not providing. Not, as I said, not always their fault that they're not providing. So, I, I mean... We, we, we make this, we can sell this, therefore this is what people most want. It's provably not true because people will pay more to live in a conservation area where you can walk to a local corner shop. They may pay more, but if people can't afford to pay more, is what the volume house builder is offering. A range of types, building types within a pattern, actually a necessary evil. Oh, well, that's a different question. That's about um, uh, volume of house building and, and supply and demand. Um, so, yeah, I perhaps I should choose my words more carefully. Um, uh, good places should, I mean, and I'm afraid too, too frequently, yeah, not always are, good places should not be the uh, preserve of the, um, you know, of the prosperous. I mean, our aim as a society should surely be that a place that is not just good enough, but actually attractive and beautiful and humane is something that most of us are able to live in. And we aren't actually saving the nice village centres just for the you know, nice middle class people who've had a nice job and retired to the rural Yorkshire. Um, and, you know, chucking off all the key workers working huge hours for not very much money as starter nurses uh, into somewhere where they have to drive in a, sit in a car to go anywhere. And they've got a tiny garden that they can't properly use because it's overseen in five different directions. Um, so, so no, I, I disagree with that. Please forgive me. Will you forgive me? Um, there's lots of noise coming from upstairs. I just need to shut the door. Forgive me. Yeah, sure. Sorry, the, the perils of home broadcasting. <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> okay, so um, I'd, I'd like to, to, to move on to an, a, another 
string in your bow, if you like, which is the um, the office for place and uh, your role in um, developing this new entity, I suppose, is, is what um, I think is where we are at the moment. Would that be correct? Yes. Yes, I think that's probably correct. Yeah. So what what is what some people might not be familiar with the, the sort of general aim of, of, of this new body or this emerging body. Just just tell us what it's about. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm to, to limit expectations, I should say I'm, I'm very much here with my Crate Streets hat on. I have to be careful, otherwise I should have some civil service minder sitting next to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's still a latent body, although it has been notionally launched I and mean, it hasn't really done much yet. Um, uh, the, the aim, at, following on from changes in the national planning policy framework um, and the new national model design code, which I think we're coming to, and an and anticipation of some of the changes that might, um, uh, or might not, who knows, we'll come to that, come in the planning bill, um, the aim of the Office of Place is to help and encourage uh, councils, and I think also uh, parishes, neighbourhood forums and community groups, uh, to help sort of shift the planning system from being one that's very development control focused to one that has clearer quality ask. And this is one of the really clear recommendations, I hope it was clear recommendations that came out of the, the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, which you mentioned, which reported at the beginning of last year. Um, so the uh, what does good look like around here? What type of development do we wish to encourage? What do we want to discourage? One of the most consistent themes that comes up in the feedback from community groups, including I think your own, um, is that it's too easy for bad stuff to happen and there's not enough pressure on developers to create good stuff. And the problem is once that's inherent in the system, and not priced into the land, if you buy land, say in Leeds Town Centre, speaking hypothetically, uh, thinking that no one's going to control the quality of the building materials and you can just build up to 15 stories and no one cares you're just going to pile it in once you've built it on that basis um and you're just looking at the economics of one individual plot rather than the city as a whole um well and if you're told you have to do something good well it's, it's a bit too late because you've sort of built it on the built on the base of something else so just have clearer quality asks in the in the local plan so our, our role is and you know, this is something that is new essentially or largely new to, to many local officials and i think to quite a lot of neighborhood forums and, and parishes, um, how to evolve good and effective and popular, and provably so, uh, neighbourhood uh, plans, sorry, excuse me, design codes uh, and, and other quality asks in local plans. So I, I could go on and add much more, but I'd say, I think it's that, and perhaps just a little bit more broadly is to help then, to help the British design and development and planning industry actually respond to that and respond to actually the growingly good information about what is popular and where people like and those relationships that I talked about between um, place and outcome for humans because there's a whole new world opening up of this data it's getting much much richer than it was and you know to anyone listening and I noticed we've gone down another we've gone down to eight to five now so I better hurry up yeah to anyone listening there's a lot out there do read it it's actually fascinating mm. um uh you know I think as an opportunity for the British design and development industry to get really good at that and I think we should so that's that's perhaps the other side of what we're trying to do so people will be familiar with design um, guides, uh, local authorities produce design guides for particular locations, um, neighbourhood design statements often touch upon these issues. Um, you know, what is, what, 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 I suppose the question is what, is, what does a design code do that those documents don't do? Um, and I think that the, the best way to think about it is uh, that it's a more visual document. So uh, at their best, design guides are great. Um, at their worst, they're a statement of sort of vague principles that don't really add up to much. And, you know, and you know, most are, of course, somewhere in, in between. But the difference between a design code done well, and bluntly, they're not all done well, is it's shorter. It's what it should be. It's more visual. It uses much simpler, clearer, more concise, concise language. Um, either, you know, you must do this or must not. You should or should not, or you could or could not. So it's very clear this... It's got things that are embedded into the land that come if you're going to buy this land and try to do something on it. Oh, and indeed other things it might be guidance, but perhaps a less, uh, less emphatically so. Um, it relies more on, if you like, um, objective uh, images and numbers. I, you know, you can go as high as this. The setback can be so many metres. Uh, the ratio between the height of this building and the street there or the bay width or the following five build material types are acceptable. Um, you may have a sort of a pressure cooker clause. So if you, if you want to do something else, you know, apply here, but be, be aware that it's going to be tougher. Um, 
and, and that's it. I mean, so I could probably go on. But so, so essentially, a design code is more visual and more objective and clearer about what is and isn't acceptable most of the time. It probably doesn't, it shouldn't normally try and set criteria all of the time, but it's about defining the good ordinary more visually. And I think one of the reasons it's, I hope, of relevance or of interest to, to you and to similar organizations up in other countries is that certainly the evidence in our personal experience, our experience in Create Streets is that once you start talking about places, yeah, with actually with more pictures and with a greater emphasis on actually how it feels like to walk in or to look like, you can engage a far wider proportion of the population. So, I mean, we, um, uh, the, the, I mean, the planning reform bill, the, the, the proposals that were produced a year ago, I'm trying to think uh, how long it, it was, was now. August last year, so it's more than a year ago, it's more like 18 months, but yeah, yeah, getting on for that, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they've been looked at again, I think we were expecting something to come forward um, uh, sooner and, and, and that's being looked at. But I think we, you would probably agree that given you know, all the different aspects of that design is the one thing I think that is the, 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 the idea of good design, shall we say. Well, it's quite, well, it's quite hard to argue again. They should do, shouldn't they? Yeah, yes, yeah. one hopes so. <laughs> um, so, in, in the in the in I mean the, the, my understanding of the, of the of the proposals are that in a sense by using design codes you know you set parameters which mean that maybe on a on a building by building level um, the, the, there is the, there's perhaps less need for scrutiny because you're setting as, you, as, you, as you've talked about you're setting the parameters in a, in a, in a visual uh, basis. I think a, a criticism of the bill was how you can continue and you mentioned this because now you, you, you say that actually it, 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 it increases or improves community engagement of course many people um, uh, on this on this call and, and many groups across the country will be familiar with dealing with planning applications at an individual level and and, and looking at the design of a particular building and saying that we think this could be improved or we or, or we like it or we, we don't like it or whatever um, and there's a sense that you know this is something that you can grab hold of. You, you see the design, you see the building, you can make you can make observations about it. When you're looking at a broader, in a broader context, uh, in a particular area or a particular um, zone, um, you know some people would say it's actually hard for community the communities to engage. How do you ensure that communities can engage more effectively in in, in developing design codes and interpreting them? Um, thank you. It's a very very good question. Um, if I may just want to sort of preface to my response, which is that, of course, under the new national planning policy framework and with the new national design code in place, which actually does encourage a bit more than encourage local councils to, to create uh, codes and to work and indeed neighbourhood forums and parishes. I think to some degree it's already happening. So I think part of the, the future for design codes is I think they will be more used in the system, come what may on the planning bill. So I, I, I'm about to answer your question, but sort of I think... Uh, you know, whatever happens to the planning bill, and I think um, you know, we're not quite clear what's going to happen to the planning bill. Uh, you know, to some degree, uh, we're moving in this direction. Um, I mean, I, I, you may not like what I'm about to say, so you know, apologies in advance. No, 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 <laughs> no offence or no irritation is intended. Um, it is, I think, worth saying. Well, actually, well two things. Uh, first of all, I, I have complete sympathy with that concern about the direction of uh, planning. And given what I was saying a few minutes ago, that was inherently a suspicion about the quality of new development. And you, you probably have seen the national stats on this. Uh, you know, given that suspicion, I think a concern about stripping away uh, influence and control over development control processes is entirely natural and, and reasonable. Uh, and given the current levels of public trust, and I, I think I go further, the current levels of quality, of what we build, I don't blame you. And did he, I, I would share, I, I do share that concern. Um, I think where um, where we need to get, well, I was going to say something longer term, let me make a short, a short sort of comparative point. I think it is worth saying um, we as a country do have quite a strange planning system, which actually plans less and development controls more. So the, the degree to which we have a verbal policy, not regulatory, unclear, covering a large area, you know, dinner time, feeding time for lawyers of a local plan is, is at one end of the, of, of the spectrum. Most plans in most countries, not all, I mean, Ireland is more like us and Portugal is a bit weird and America is a bit of a hard to, to categorise in one grey, but most European countries and a fair bit of the states, actually, and increasingly Australia and New Zealand, which are sort of departing from our approach, um, tend to have local plans which are more regulatory 
less policy, either clear about what you can and can't do, um, and cover a small area. That's not true of Australia. Um, and if you like more of the local politics, the arguments, which are appropriate to have, do happen at the um, uh, at the local plan setting phase and less at the development control setting phase. Now, I think one of the troubles that the, the, uh, the white paper ran into is they wanted to jump from A to B. I don't think you can do that. I think if you, Martin, your, your neighbours in Leeds, equivalents of you, and indeed of me up and down the country, if we're going to, as a society, consent in some of the, uh, the democracy moving forwards, clearly our level of confidence in the quality of placemaking is going to have to increase from where it now is. And I, I guess that's part of what my purpose in life is to try and do. Because if we, you know, I mean, again, so not answering your question, but I think stating an objective fact in much of the country, uh, it's obviously worse in the southeast, but it's not just in the southeast. In much of the country, we do not have enough homes, and the inequality being perpetrated on younger generations, I think, is profound. So I think there is a collective need to build more homes. Clearly, the politics of that is jolly hard. So I think you know, we do we do need to find a way of defining more clearly what is acceptable, so we can just gently, in the right way at the right time. Uh, allow it to happen more straightforward. Just to give an example, one of the major developments I often cite as a case study, and it's a jolly good one, uh, though a long way from Leeds, forgive me, is the, the Nans Ledden urban extension to Newquay in Cornwall. Um, what's happened there is as the, as the town, I mean, I should say it is, it is an exemplary good development, it's better than Poundbury, uh, it's also done by the Duchy of Cornwall. Um, uh, the Cornwall Council has put in place over the years a local development order working with the landowner, which essentially has allowed, and again, this may be not popular, what I'm about to say, has allowed the landowner essentially to grant themselves planning permission within the agreed framework. It's very much within the agreed master plan and certain house types. That's not politically contentious for a nanosecond. Not only does no one mind, everyone's delighted about it because it's it's just such a great place they're creating. So we've got to find our paths to that. I, I can see about three people have just left the call. So I think I've just started irritating people. I do apologize. There you go. I, I hope that's vaguely helpful. It's, it's meant to be, and I'm sorry if it's challenging. I'm not trying to be uh, irritating. You're not being irritating at all. But let, let me just uh, let me just put, put this to you then. Um, so uh, you know, an urban extension. You, you, I think, I think you can imagine because to be honest, an urban extension is either going to be often a volume house builder identical set of houses, which you know, all right, in theory, there's a there's a development control element to that, but in practice, it's the same houses they were building in ten different places. So in, in fact, people may think they've got some control, but they they really they don't. Haven't. No. And people actually, people complain, they want this control. In reality, they don't, because often actually the, 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 the control is a myth, actually, at the development level. Yeah. So I can see, I can see how, how, you know, I can see how, you know, um, I, being firmer on, on, on some of these placemaking issues uh, in relation to an urban extension works, you know, you know, could work really well. But how does it work in relation to a, a, a you know, an existing settlement where you're talking about infill, you're talking about developing small plots of land, you're talking about an area that may have different characteristics, but but nonetheless could be part of the, an overall design code. How do you sort? How do you ensure that that, that there is that element of um, variation? You know, how how can you build in variation? Um, I, I'm a th it's very, again, it's a very good question. Thank you, Martin. Um, I, I think in part it's about accepting that. In that type of situation, a design code is not for everything, and I and I think it's interesting. I've had some conversations actually with, with local planners that have sort of brought the importance of this point home to me. Um, I better not I better not say where, but I was giving a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago where we're having you know a version of this a version of this conversation, uh, and I made the point that I think most local plans should aspire to be shorter and more visual. And the response was, um, "But hang on, we can't do that because if we're trying to design code for you know this borough, I won't say where." Um, we'll have to do a design code for every street and every building. Um, and I, that was, it was a kachung moment for me because I suddenly realized what, if you like, the problem for this, this, this perfectly well-intentioned official I was speaking to was, she assumed that the design code was to cover every eventuality. And it, and it not only should it not, does it not need to be that, it should not be that. So um, is this about turning off, I'm sorry, this is me speaking, it's not, I don't speak for the government, I should be absolutely clear, but as I see the future, um, is this about turning off planning? No. Is it about trying to define certain situations, certain types of development, which can get easier because they're fitting to a pre-agreed and, and approved locally popular formula in some circumstances? I think it's that. And that doesn't mean any, any property in any situation. 
and in some ha towns it'll be easier and in others it'll be hard i i was in a town uh in the on the, on the northeast coast again about, about two three weeks ago which has got a lot of empty plots in it it's not a very prosperous town um it, the although the council owns a fair bit of the land there's also a fair bit in, in other ownership could you i think you know could you could you conceive in that town putting in place a design code for a series of you know two to five story house or mixed use building types that could fit into quite a lot of those plot types which are empty uh, in quite a lot of the plots yes i think you could if if, the, if you don't have empty plots central leeds clearly doesn't have empty plots let's assume it doesn't but not last time i went it didn't um that gets harder but could you put in a design code that allows you to go up a mansard roof high on some building typologies yes yes you could so i so i think it's about just trying to to find ways in which intensification or development of some types can happen straightforwardly through a normal regulatory function rather than through a case-by-case -case function and accepting that doesn't cover everything and again forgive me i'm lecturing the point I'm perhaps laboring the point a bit but pretty much all sort of definitions of good regulation uh, assert that i mean with good with good reason i think assert that good regulation is predictable and doesn't matter you know, like how deep your pockets are or who you know. And, I, you know, I mean, the, the British planning system is remarkably uncorrupt, given how corruptible it is or could be. Um, um, but the, the, the built-in advantage that bigger developers with bigger pockets have over smaller developers with smaller pockets is very, very profound and is a problem. Um, uh, we have probably the most concentrated development market in the Western world. And again, it's because of that very high level of planning risk, pre-planning. Uh, you know, and again, I think that is a problem, and I think we as a society do do sort of need to worry about that. Could I um, th thank you for that. That, that? that that that's actually really helpful. Um, there's a couple more things, and we, I, I don't want to keep you all all, all night, Nicholas. That's okay. And, we're uh, down to seventy six now, so we want to we want to finish gone down about twelve fifty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so just a couple more things um, I'd like to cover. Um, uh, transport and how how transport uh, needs are integrated into into the planning process. It's something that we probably don't do very well, is my feeling. Um, so, how do you think we can do better on that score? How do you think we can we can integrate tra transport needs into our planning system? And I, I wouldn't claim uh, to know as much about this. I do hopefully know a little bit about some other things. Um, uh, I think two points I'd make. Um, one is that, uh, as I understand it, the models we're still using for um, uh, traffic modeling of uh, future traffic requirements are essentially one of you know, just projecting out more and more traffic requirements rather than saying, well, we can actually control this. We can actually decide how much uh, vehicular transport we will be creating or permitting. Uh, you know, and there are different methodological ways to working out how many cars we will require. And at the moment, we seem to be stuck in a vortex of assuming it's a lever upwards. Well, it will be ever upwards if we just sort of model it will ever upwards and then to provide the infrastructure. Um, I, I was, again, uh, looking at a town recently uh, where the town council was simultaneously trying to propose uh, in, in city regeneration whilst, you know, splurging God knows how many millions, probably more than millions, on lots of dual carriageways really very close to the town centre going out to um, drive to cul-de-sac developments. Well, you sort of can't do both. So I think we need to have the guts to say, and this is perhaps not always easy, um, certainly in or near town centres, we are going to be uh, not modelling for ever increasing traffic increase. I mean, there's a place for cars. I'm not anti-car, but it, it isn't in or near larger town centres or, 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 or within m many existing urban settlements. So I think point one on that. Um, point two is, uh, is, is uh, perhaps is the other side of that. And I'm sorry, this is not a train response. I'll, I'm probably not the right person to answer on that. Um, clearly the future of how we get around in urban settlements is going to be different to the past. I mean, we as a society, in fact, pretty much all societies, made a sort of major character error about 60, 70 years ago, where we assumed that these marvellous things called cars that have been invented suddenly started being used by rich people in the 1920s and 30s. That the liberty that you know, Bertie Worcester had driving you know, poop poop along in the English countryside in 1930 was something that we could all have and it wouldn't matter. Um, sadly, I mean, cars are great at giving us all the same liberty that, you know, you had to be a duke to have in the 19th century, but self-evidently it, it, it doesn't work in town centres without externalities of you know, lost liberty being greater than the liberty we gain. So we need, for example, I think, this, this, the, the electric bikes are a game changer. They allow people to bicycle and allow you to bicycle in places that you just can't otherwise, or at least not unless you're very fit. Um, E-scooters are a game changer. We need to treat them like bikes and get them 
you know, legal on roads and illegal on pavements. And the reason they're being certainly in London, I don't know if it's happening in Leeds, but being ridden illegally on pavements is you can't ride them on the on the on the road. So often the answer is not the highest tech answer. It's actually something that's been staring us in the face all along. We just need to get a bit more efficient at doing it. So I, I think it's ultimately it's about allowing us to get around in town centres and in denser neighbourhoods by bicycle, e-bike, e-scooter, and I should imagine there's some sort of e-rickshaw, smaller e-car coming as well. So I think the future, I think, is is a sort of well done low tech rather than dramatic high tech. We um, we have um, in in Leeds uh, a lot of development now taking place in what we call the South Bank, the south of the of the River Air, um, in the in near the city centre. In the city centre, it, it, it's um, the council will talk about doubling the size of the city centre uh, over a period of time. Um, these are mainly apartment schemes, um, sometimes for students, sometimes rented, some some of them for sale, um, but. You know, for many people, they don't feel necessarily like community developments. Uh, they're just built in isolation. Um, and very often the, the, the infrastructure that, that you need, nurseries, doctor's surgeries, etc., cetera, um, don't come alongside these developments. Um, ha, do, do you think city centres in general are, are places where families should live? Um, London, I, I think, is a slightly different example, but you know, certainly outside of London, do you think city centres, generally speaking, should be regarded as places where where families should live, and how do you design that in? I, I won't answer for Leeds because I was going to travel because you, 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 and everyone else listening knows more about it than I do. Um, uh, I think I think we have to accept because it's true, and you can see it in the pricing and in the preference data that uh, families with children, above all families with young children, put a greater premium on space and immediate access to green space. So the key thing that most parents want, and they're quite rational to want it, um, is, is green, one of the key things I should say, is obviously enough, enough home to have, have their children in, of space, but also immediate access to green space so little Johnny or Jane or whoever can go and play readily without needing to be consistently and constantly supervised. Um, that clearly is going to, to some degree, take you out of most town centres, uh, certainly if they're at very high densities. It doesn't mean taking you out of pretty high densities. So, you know, uh, you talked about sort of vernacular building typologies before. You know, a Georgian house typology at three or four storeys on a five and a half metre wide frontage with a you know, garden at the back, you're still getting up at very high densities, far higher than I suspect all but pretty central leads. I'm, I'm speculating, I'm very happy to be corrected. Um, so, no, it do, you, can you have children in or near the town centre? Yes, you can. Uh, can you have them in the highest density areas? No, you can't. Uh, should you have them in, in town centres? I, I would personally argue, yes, you should up to a point, but not probably the, the very heart of the very busiest. Um, and that the best communities, and again, the evidence is pretty consistent on this, have a mix. And, you know, uh, that mix of old and young, rich and poor, uh, all, the, all the, you know, happy heterogeneity of life is something that most of us do prefer most of the time. If a last question, well, penultimate question. Um, so we have this design revolution. We have- um, It's a revolution, have, I'm not sure it is yet, but hopefully. Well, well, no, I'm talking about the future, yeah? yeah. Um, how is it funded at a local authority level? How do local authorities find the resources? You know, planning departments have been shrinking in recent years. How do we find that the sort of money and resource required, and, and, and it's also about training, of course, to bring, to bring in design capability into local authorities so that these things can actually happen in a way that they haven't happened up until now? How does, how does that happen, do you think? Um, I'll give you a, a, an easy answer and a harder answer. So the easy answer is more money. Um, yeah. so I asked the previous Secretary of State in a conference I was chairing uh, a bit over a year ago, you know, do, do we need more money to do this? And he said, yes. So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a government commitment that there should be. Um, I don't know what the new Secretary of State thinks, but um, so I think there is a role for more money, obviously. Um, but I don't think it's quite as simple as that. So this bit of the answer may be less uh, well received. I don't know. Um, if we are able over time systemically to start planning less weirdly and to, well, let me put it different, actually to start planning better, you know, we are planning more and development controlling a little bit less, not, you know, um, that, you know, it is inherently a more efficient thing to do to plan than to, to develop and control, because to some degree you can let the development look after itself and you check that people were honest about what they would said they would do. And if they're not, then you come down on like a, a you know, in a ton of bricks, put on corrigé les autres. Um, so in the medium term, I recognise, you know, if you're, if you're a manager running a process tomorrow, this doesn't help. It is about moving the bulk or proportion of resources up to the front end of the process and having a clearer local plan 
uh, and being less reliant on case by case uh, development control. Uh, I think the exciting thing, there are no get out of jail on this, but I think one exciting thing that does genuinely have real potential, and this actually, I think this was the other thing that wasn't controversial in the white paper, is better digitization of the flow of development control. And the, 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 I think the opportunity here is really quite, quite exciting. So certainly, you know, back garden extensions, PD, rooftop extensions, some of, if you like, the, the bread and butter of the smaller stuff, uh, you know, there are now quite, I think, pretty well-functioning uh, process tools. Uh, Southwark in London is, is piloting them as a range of others that really can start take them, taking the man and the woman out of the loop. Not to say there's not the capacity to quality control and check the weird ones, but just the stuff that doesn't actually, you know, can be computed straightforwardly. So, so I think there is that opportunity there. And I think there is a strategic need to rebalance where we put people's time but does that get us off the hook of more funding in the short to medium term? No, I don't think it does, and I don't think it should. Clive just put a, a point on the comment about uh, PD, permitted development. Um, do, do you think design codes actually, and, and they are, I mean, permitted development uh, rights have increased in recent years, something that we get frustrated about at the Trust. Um, do you think design codes in some ways could be a replacement for that approach that actually you don't have so much permitted development but but that's encapsulated in a in a, in a design code in a, in a in a or even in a local plan for example well i mean uh you know the local development orders which are nature similar to permitted development it's just they've been chosen to happen by the local yeah. council that i was talking about earlier in cornwall essentially they are permitted development with very clear standards i don't yeah. think there's anything conceptually wrong and i think there's a lot to be said it's conceptually right about permitted development, which has been locally strategically approved and which has clear standards. Now, to, to be controversial, uh, I'm ending on a bad note, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of understandable controversy about retail to residential conversion. Uh, but at the same time, we've got 17.5% of our shops vacant. And at the same time, we don't have enough houses in the right places. And at the same time, we're quite rightly worrying about sustainable development. And one is, of the key criteria, as I'm sure you all know, of our energy footprint isn't actually how energy efficient our house is, it's where it is and how much we have to walk versus drive in our daily life. So those are all good reasons why we should be, you know, if there are shops lying vacant, thinking how can we repurpose some of these to be homes or, or, or other uses. As long as you've got in place, and I recognise that comes with some difficult challenges as bins and access, I'm, I'm not saying it's always straightforward, but if you've got very clear standards in place about the design and about what what the consequences of what can and can't happen inside are um a lot of shops are pretty similar in terms of their width and shape and there are some there are clearly going to be some weird situations can you permitted development with a design code and with clear accepted uh, frameworks for what is and isn't acceptable uh, I, not only do i think you can i know you can because we've done we've done schemes of that nature and we're working on something similar right now in the, in, um, in in the south of england so so yes i I, th I think you can and i go further i think you should and I think it's unfortunate that permitted development has come through has been one where it's not possible to put clear quality standards over it. Because I think that's that that that's the answer, frankly. I hope that's uh, sorry, Clive, if that annoys. It's not it's not meant to, and I apologize. <laughs> Nicholas, final question. Um it's been a great uh, discussion, really enjoyed it. And I think uh, we've kept the numbers reasonably buoyant throughout the last three quarters of an hour. So um, you know, well done. Um, could could you just tell us? If we were to go visit somewhere in the in this country that sort of encapsulates some of the good things that you think design and placemaking should um, should involve, where would that place be? Can you give us a, an example of somewhere? It could be a, an old place. It could be a, a, a new place. Where would you Where would you tell us to go? Thank you. That's a very that's a very good question. It's, 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 and I didn't give you any warning of this. No, question, no, no, no. So. And, and it, it, it's asked it's asked so abstractly because it. Yeah. Um, well, why don't I um, answer at two extremes? I think the best way to answer that is personally because there are many ways you could answer that question. It's a very good and very unfair question. I'll, I'll <laughs> answer it. I'll answer it personally, and I'm afraid it will therefore be a little bit southern reference. So please, please forgive me. Um, I think one of the most uh, excellently done intense very high density but very humane uh developments in the country is pimlico in the in sort of in west central london uh which has an average uh homes per hectare i think about 175 homes per hectare which would be way higher densities than you get in most of the country and you'd never know it walking around that it is so intensely occupied um and it's uh, it's probably the closest anywhere in the uk gets to sort of parisian in terms of its form and nature 
I'm not saying all of the country should be like that. I'm not, not saying Leeds should be like that. Uh, so that, that would be one example I'd give. Uh, uh, and another example I give, which sort of makes a slightly different point, um, I partly come from, or to spend a little time in, uh, in, in, in Wiltshire, Dorset, on the border there. Uh, there's a famous um, street there, which people of a certain age, uh, my age or upwards, will know, because um, it, it pretended to be northern for the Hovis advertisements uh, from 40 years ago, which some of you will remember. Now, actually, it wasn't northern. It was in, it was in Dorset. It was Shaftesbury. Um, yes. And it's a, it's a street called Gold Hill, which curves down curves down the uh, the hill. I should say that in some surveys we've done, streets that curve down hills are consistently the most popular in many surveys. Um, that street would be inconceivable to build now. It breaks so many access, and I'm not anti-access regulations, I'm all for them, but it breaks so many rules and regulations, you wouldn't even, you'd level the whole thing, you would, would never even go there. And yet it creates a place of you know, mesmerizing beauty that people travel for miles to photograph and walk up and down and you know, feel slightly transfixed. When I first, I remember it oddly, when I first, um, or sorry, an early time I went with one of my children there, you know, he just gasped at it, you know, as a small child. So I'm not saying, again, the country should be covered in gold hills. You couldn't if you wanted to, but we do need to create, we need to have the courage to create places that will make a small child gasp in wonder. Um, and sometimes that will mean breaking some of the rules that we impose upon ourselves. Okay, end of advertisement for gold hill. I'm not on commission. Well, that's a great, a great answer, I, I, and I think um, the two examples you give there really give, give the, yeah, give the range of, 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 of form, you know, formality versus informality, if you like. And I think that's a, a wonderful way of um, answering the question. So, I think we're done, Nicholas. Um, really you. grateful for your time this evening. Um, we look forward to um, uh, hearing more about the the good work that Create Streets. Are doing and um, some of the other things we've touched on which no doubt in the m weeks and months to come we'll hear more about so uh, thank you very much. Th thank you total pleasure and I'm sorry I've just realized there are questions in the chat which I haven't responded to I'm, I'm sorry I didn't see they were coming through so please don't worry about that we, we, we'll um, I think we've covered some of them in the, in the conversation so um, we'll um, um, maybe maybe you'll come back another time and we can cover some of those other issues. Well, hopefully I'll come to Leeds in itself. That'd be much, much, Absolutely. much better. Absolutely, that'd be great. Yeah. All right. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.